So this part is called the chart simulation of uh, our day. So before I continue, I, I want to ask you a question. Do you think Chinese China is a centralized country? I mean, the administrative system, is this a centralized country or not? Uh, it, it is partially centralized and uh, Chinese together. In the sense, they say that uh, the, all, all the province, they have autonomy on their own. Carry out uh, their development of each province. But yet they have uh, a central body that controls everything, although they have the autonomy on their own. So that's why I say China is partially central and every it's not centralized. <laughs> I think you have Jack, Jack knows that it was China. I think you have done a whole job here. <laughs> yes, uh, many, many, uh, many of my friends said uh, China is uh, generally speaking as a, a centralized country, centralized country, because we have, um, look at this. So China, I will tell you the reason. Okay, I will tell you when um, this, no matter it's partly centralized or centralized, or then I will tell you when it comes from like this. So at present, China has 34 administrative divisions, 23 provinces. Those blue, those in blue, whatever. And then autonomous region, group five. Oh, no, the, the blue one, autonomous regions. The, the purple one are provinces. And four, this, this, these green ones are municipalities. And then these little, two little red ones, they are special administration regions, as Hong Kong and Macau. One, one extra thing. When you, where is it? Taiwan, Taiwan. Taiwan, yes? Very good. Whenever you, you, you do your homework, okay? Whenever you use your map, you use, use China's map, you have to include that. In your homework, you would never be smart. Otherwise, it's bad. <laughs> all right. So, um, under the law, they are all approximately equal, no matter how big, no matter it's big or small. You know, autonomous region basically they are minorities. Right? In Tibet, in Xinjiang, autonomous region majority. They are minorities. Minority people in the autonomous regions are minorities in China. Okay, there are four level of the administration system. That's the answer. Central government, right? Beijing central government, and then province, province, and then city, and then village. So basically, the administrative system in China is four levels. The four levels. They are actually from top to to low for levels. And then why it come from this uh, this uh, four levels? Because actually it can be traced back to two thousand years ago. Two thousand years ago, uh, at the early time in China, two thousand years ago, there are more than one hundred countries or vessel states recorded in China, 140 countries in China. And then with 360 years of war, those kings fight each other, fight for food, fight for people, fight for resources. And then it continued for more than 300 years. And then finally, seven left. From 140 to seven, only seven left. And in the year of 2000, uh, 221 BC, this, this, this one, the bigger one in the West China, defeated the other six. And since then, China became a unified country until now. So that's this, the, the one who defeated the other six is this emperor, Emperor Qin Shi Huang. Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor in China's history. And this one is the one who unified China. So we, we call it the very first emperor, Qin Shi Huang. Very powerful man. 
And then uh, he thinks them we, we are in unified country. And then this great person, this great emperor, he uh, has done many, many great things. But the only thing that today I want to mention is that Great War. Everybody knows Great War, yeah? One who does not know Great War, put up your hand. You don't know Great War. <laughs> yeah, the Great War is the symbol, kind of symbol of China, right? Do you know how long is it? How long? 2500? Double it, 5000 kilometers. It stretches 5,000 kilometers, and it, it, it was built by this emperor. By this start building it by this emperor, although many, many dynasties continue to build it. And then think about that um, in Qing Dynasty, that is 2,000 years ago, and the population there is only 20 million. 20 billion. And the technology, think about the technology of 2,000 years ago. And this uh, great was built on hills, right? And the top of the hills. Very, very difficult place. And I think about 2,000 years ago, the technology and only 20 million people, the Jin, Jin Su Huang can build it without a unified country, without a very centralized administrative system, can he do it? Never, right? So this emperor, Qin Shi Huang, in order to control the vast lands, and he divided the country into 60, uh, three, uh, 36 parts to administer. And then uh, at that time, since that time, the concept of a unified nation means a strong power become the foundation of China of all the Chinese government system. Make sense? From the Great War. Okay, this is the why it is centralized. And it is centralized from 2000 years ago. It's not it's not the products of the founding of this country. It is the products of 2000 years ago from the first emperor in China. So the reason why I talk about this, uh, um, I, I choose the I choose only some of the um, information about China, which are very closely related to poverty in Indonesia. Okay, there are new no. The second thing is that China's uh, what do you think about China's resources? It's a rich country in resources or poor country in resources. Sources, I mean, natural resources. Uh, rich or poor? Uh, rich? Rich, yeah. Rich? Yeah. So, land area, the third largest, just ran after Russia and Canada. Yes? Land, rich, yeah. yeah. And then, China besides uh, 171 types of mineral resources, and one of them ranked top 10. The world rich, yes, but you are not. And the third, so can you see a, a few maps? Questions What is the map you can see from this map? What's your what's your what 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 can you say from conclude from this uh, map? Yeah. Yeah. This is a map of China, yes, yes. I know. <laughs> And then? Yeah. Right. Right. So from west to the east, you can see the latitude is what? Yes. So it's an a west an elevated. It's an elevated west and a low lying east from this map. map. Got it? Second. From this map, what can, what can you see? The arable land. The arable land is, is only this, the, 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 the green one. 
So China is the third largest land area country in the world. But the arable land, the land who can produce cost, only here, only here. The other places, mostly mountains. So the arable land here is only 12% of the total land in China. So you can say that is the basically distribution of all the land areas. There are 33% 30, of mountains, 26 plateaus, 19 basins, 12 plains, 10 hills. So two thirds of the country land areas are mountains. Arable land 12%. And the cent central and western regions are wastelands and deserts. In those areas, let's say those are the lands, so those wastelands and the deserts. So these are all countries, not not all cities or places like Beijing. These are all China. In those places, cold in winter, hot in summer, few rain, and it's not obviously not favorable. For crops, crops, right? But that is what China has. One population. Hello, India. <laughs> so the population, China is the largest population, has the population in, in the world. And this accounts for 18% of the public of the world total population. 18%, nearly 20 of the world's population. So summarize. To summarize, China is a centralized administrative system, centralized country, rich in resources. Question mark. Just show us like the, the map of China, and we've seen that there is like a, a part which is available, which is too small, but also the population which is too many people. So I wanted to know like how you guys do to increase all the population. Like is this small part that you guys use to increase all the people? Yes. How I can tell you. So with only uh, those uh, twelve percent of arable land in China, and this twelve percent arable land and arable land accounts for seven percent of the world total, and the population accounts for twenty, almost twenty percent of the world total. Right? That is China. Popul that that is China, and then how are we going to? With this 7%, how to feed 20%? Yeah. Yeah? Is there a question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is what I'm going to talk about. China's situation. These four parts. First, how do you say, anyone knows SDDS? As a, as a student in forestry, you are supposed to know SDDS. Mm -hmm. Anyone know SDDS? Who made it? The United Nations. The United Nations. So SDGs means Sustainable Development Goals. It is set by the United Nations. That's basically 17 goals total SDGs set by, set by United Nations. Those are, those are the 17 goals. And the top one is no poverty, okay, and by the United Nations. So it's a world consensus on eliminating poverty. 
and it's the top one. So the goal, the goal is to end the poverty in all its forms, everywhere. So that's the United Nations. So by definitions, you know, by U.S. definition of extreme poverty is uh, measured by money, by money, uh, in monetary measures. That means people living on less than U.S. dollars, no more than 1.9 U.S. dollars. Basically, uh, 2.3 U.S. dollars. This uh, we call it extreme. They are under uh, extreme poverty. That means severe depletion of basic needs like food, shelter, drinking water, sanitation, healthcare, education, and access to information. But that's the definition of United Nations, and we China, Chinese government have another definition. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you. It's a little, it's a little video that then, then, then we will tell you how, what, what is the definition by our Chinese. Poverty alleviation is one of the biggest stories to come out of China in recent years. Since 2019, I've traveled across the countryside to experience firsthand the work on the ground. Some concepts related to the project can be hard to understand, including the term extreme poverty, which China says was eliminated nationwide in late 2020. So what exactly is extreme poverty? Definition of extreme poverty goes beyond the income dimension to include living conditions. In Kuaizhou, a village in southwest China, Sichuan province, I visited during my reporting on poverty alleviation. A household officially registered as poor can only be taken off that list after meeting a long list of criteria. That includes access to clean water, proper sanitation, electricity, even having a functioning television. So it's not just about what family earns, it's also about how it lives. So that's the Chinese definition of uh, poverty elimination. That's the goal of, of, of the, of the uh, poverty elimination. Then I'll continue with some the Chinese achieve, achievements of up to now in poverty elimination. So according to, um, that is uh, just now we mentioned about what China has. We have 7% arable land, 18% of our population. And when it divided by 1.4 billion population, so China ranks 36 in the world. According to the national, the Chinese National Bureau statistics, in, two, in 1978, it's about 800 million our people, population in China. And until now, zero. From last year, zero. And this, this map is from the World Bank. The red one is the world population of poverty, under extreme poverty. And this um, black one is the Chinese poverty population. So you can say China has achieved zero extreme poverty 10 years ahead of UNSDGS well, schedule. Because UNSDGS said 2030 it will achieve the goal, but China, late last year, China has already achieved it. In China, for this such a big country, we can see there are zero population zero households are under extreme poverty. Now, so that is the um, three years ago, no, four years ago, 2017, what the um, World Bank Group on opening uh, press conference by President Jin Hongming, Ping, Jin Hongming, I don't know what that means, as the uh, annual meetings. He said, it's one of the great stories in human history. Frankly, starting in 1990, with the evolution of China's economic system and its embrace of the global market, 
China has lived its over 800 million people out of poverty. So most of the progress that has been made in going from 40% of the world living in extreme poverty to, no, to now less than 10%. Most of that progress happened in China. So we are looking, always looking for the lessons from this, from this experience and it's continued just four years ago. And then late, late last year, China has achieved that goal. How did China do that? Ready, that's your question. Very simple, four stages. Very simple, four stages. The first stage is, the, is from the foundings of the People's Republic of China to 1978. At that time, we call it the poverty elimination in command economy. Many people call it planned economy, but we think that uh, home command economy will be a suitable, more suitable uh, phrase for that. So to, as the funding of the, uh, the, of the countries, we have very, very low protective forces. China now said at the funding, at the very beginning, uh, 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 just uh, after the uh, liberation, the funding of the country, they said to, uh, to, 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 the, to, to, to the officials, what we can build, what we can make. We can make, we can make uh, chairs, uh, tables, we can grow uh, crops, but we can not produce a car. We cannot produce a plane. Not on, not not to mention rockets or such offensive things as funding as the funding father of the country at the beginning. So and because uh, at that time we have very low protective forces because we have many years of uh, war. With, with the, the Japanese uh, invasions. And then we are not lucky. We were not lucky at that time. There are very large scale famine, hunger everywhere in China. And then at that time, the government focused on very basic survival problems with very, very li with limited policy tools to use. So at that time, the goal is to restore and develop production to ensure minimum living standing of the poor groups by the government direct actions, direct giving supplies, direct giving them jobs okay, to, to, to the people who are in real need, real need. So at that time, the effects of that the policy under the command economy, it helps. But it's very limited help. Because at that time, the annual per capita income of the farmers was only less than 20 US dollars. Annual per year, 20 US dollars. Think about that. Okay. And the growth rate of per capita income was only 1.9% at the first stage. At that time, the main problem is to survive. Okay. And the government don't have much tools, uh, policy tools to use. So that's the first stage. Second stage is from 1978 to 2012. And this time we call it the Poverty Elimination and National Development Programs. And those uh, are mm, the policy focus on regions. So the regions, the areas, you can say those uh, different colors. Those are the 14 areas we call as contiguous poverty stricken regions. So just now you, you probably you can you still remember. All those areas are what? Mountain area, right? Mountains, wasteland, deserts, those areas. Okay? So the poverty stricken regions and the it is contiguous regions, okay? Contiguous regions in 14, uh, there are 14 regions, and totally there are 509, uh, there are five, nearly 600 poor counties in those 14 regions. So at that time, by national uh, development pro programs, the main goal is, the, is to promote development of those areas and, and the narrow the regional relative gap. So this has good results. And for those 592 poor countries supported by the state, the average annual growth of uh, 
farmer per capita net income in these counties are 12.8%, higher than the national average. For the poor areas, higher than the national average, the net income. And then the proportion of rural poverty population has dropped to 2.8%. And this, the, the, the key words is region. The key words is uh, the regions. Because this, this time, it is uh, focused on region poverty elimination. And then the third, this state is very interesting and very, very important. We call it precision poverty elimination. The last, the stage, stage two, is uh, focused on regions, areas. Yes, with uh, more than 60 years of uh, develop, de development, and then those areas, it's become smaller, right? It become then, at this stage, the poor population has gradually changed from regional to points distributions. Make sense? Okay. Therefore, the states mainly focus on the individual households for this country. Okay. So usually, if you focus on individuals, that is usually the most difficult part. It's the last mile of the journey. Right? Make sense? And then the clear goal was set at that time, that is eliminate poverty by 2020. That is the goal set by the central government. How to do it? Six precision, six precision, six precise. First, to, to, to precisely find your targets means who needs help? Who is the poor person? Who is the poor household? Who is the poor family? Where? Where? So that's the home need to be helped. And the second, who to give help? Right? The one who needs help, who gives help to them? So this is a precise assignment of people or institutions to those villages. And the third one, how? How to help? It's precise, precisely find the uh, project arrangement, process matches to households, and precise of funds. How to make it? And lastly, how to evaluate? If we can, if we say the household has already been get out of the get rid of the poverty, how to evaluate? Five components of poverty elimination. So that is a very uh, in co coincidence with the UN definition. I summarize this: the two water freeze and three guarantees means no worry about food, no worry about housing. Compulsory education guaranteed in China nine years compulsory education, and then basic medical services guaranteed. Housing, no worry about clothing. Sorry, no worry about clothing. No worry about food. Two no worries, worry free, and three guarantees: education, medical, housing. Three guaranteed. Five projects put forward according to different poverty courses. For example, number one, promote, promote production. For the areas, for example, how, for areas, probably these areas are suitable or to grow like um, apple trees, right? It, because different different places they have different developments, right? For the place for who are uh, whose land where the land is suitable for grow like uh, apple trees, then the, the government will stand. Officials, technicians, even the seedlings to those areas and help the villagers, help the farmers to grow the apple tree and improve the quality of the fruits. So that's the first policy. And the second, relocation. What do you mean? Do you know what this means by relocation? What happened to relocation? Think, think, think yes. Maybe the government can, and for example, if the government finds something important in the particular piece of land where people are situated, the government can relocate the area where the people are. Move people out from the yeah. mountain area. <laughs> <laughs> the, the mountain area. For example, uh, the place where not yeah. suitable for living. Where well, most people believe in, for example, the government might find 
let's say diamond for gold or for oil. No. In this sense, in this sense, this relo this relocation means uh, ecological relocation. relocation. Later on, I will give you a case study about relocation. Okay, basically means is if a place that is uh, ecologically fragile, right, is uh, extremely not good for people's survival in the remote areas and mountains, those places, then we will reload, we, 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 we build, we build the villages with, uh, with, with very good um, um, dormitory buildings, not dormitory, apartments, not only apartments, but also Met, uh, with also hospitals, schools, and industries. Because if you relocate, if you move people out, you have to give them jobs. Yes, you have to make sure they have schools to go, and they have they can go to the hospital, right? So that that's what relocation means basically. Yeah. And you know, it's a very very difficult job for the officials, for the local officials to do, because you have you have to persuade the people. They say, I live here for generations. Why should I leave? Think about the difficulties. How can you persuade those people, those villagers, those farmers out of their, their homes, which they live for generations? Yes? So the officials, the local officials, they take a lot of time. You know, it's not very easy say, it's not like a military order. You, can, you must go, you go. No, you have to persuade them. One time, times, five times, you know, many, many, you, you have to persuade them to take them to say, this is the new home, and then you, in the new home, you have a blah, 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 such thing. You have drinking water, you have safe water, you have, you, you have hospitals, you have school, you, your children can go to the, 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 the good schools, the school education. So that takes a lot of job to do. The third one, education. Because we, Chinese, we think that education is an, the most important key key to cut off the intergenerational intergenerational poverty by welfare that's the government will save you as last as the last point oh so at the end of uh, 2020 china has held this uh, grand meeting and uh, declare we won the battle against poverty, and the nine, 100 million rural people have been lifted out of poverty ahead of the UN schedule in years. So that is the uh, official assembly. For the, the last stage is from last, last year to now. We call it a rural revitalization and common prosperity. It is a five year transition period to maintain the result of poverty elimination. Because the power, the result of uh, poverty elimination is very difficult to reach. And then you have to, you cannot say, okay, you have been lifted out of the poverty, then you go to yourself. No, the government says you have to maintain it. You have to keep, keep, them, keep them going to have to help them gain the self-sustainable de development. So it's a five, Year transition period program to help to narrow the gap between the low income and the other groups and to promote the revitalization of those poor areas until common prosperity. Case studies. So uh, just now we, you, you, I, I, I told you there, there are six positions, right? Whom to help, who gave help. And then in China, every Universities in China, every companies in China, no matter it's state-owned or private companies, and every government, no matter it's central government or provincial government or city the government, like the Beijing municipal government, every institutions in China be paired up with the counties or villages in those poor areas, including our university, Beijing Forest University. We are assigned, we are uh, paired up with a uh, uh, court with with a county called Huiyu Qianqi, and then you know Inner Mongolia. This is Inner Mongolia, and then we are paired up with here. It's a basically it's a a, a county um, of uh, Hmong minority, Hmong minorities here. So 
uh, 18 years ago, we have been one of the first bachelor university participate in this uh, national animation. What have we done? The universities have what? Knowledge. Yes, professors, right? Scientific technologists, those faculty members, that's what universities have, right? So the university, our university make full use, take full advantages of the university's advantages. We send the faculty members to the uh, to the county uh, to help them gain sustainable, gain self sustainable development. You know, we send the faculties uh, um, concerned uh, related to like forest engineering, forest breeding, gardening, um, economy, forest economy, biofood. Those faculties to carry out like uh, practical technician technology promotion, short term training, and con and consulting services and other activities. We have sent fifty more than fifty faculty members to Huichang to work there. And and in these eight years, the university has invested. 2.8 million yuan to support 29 projects ranging from cultivation, ranging from, from seedlings, how to what how to choose, what to choose according to the local land situation, what kinds of uh, species, and then how to make these species grow well, and then how to how to improve. The, the quality of those uh, like the, the, of, of those fruits and then lastly how to make it as a product and how to package it we, we, we even we even design the package for the product and finally we help the villagers to build Taobao by e-commerce and help them to and tell them how to sell on Taobao of those products. So the university has built a whole chain for the, for the villagers from seeds to products. Okay, so this is the one. This is the school of technology. Anyone from school of technology? Oh, that's, that's people, huh? <laughs> so school of technology has customer, customized the first, the first the fruit. In new creation and the cutting machine, this is a Chinese pear leaved crab apple. Crab apple. So that is the local fruit in China, and this is the machine. The school of technology, the faculty, the professors made that customized us, and then increasing such. This is uh, increasing the, the 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 production and the money be made from this. Uh, these products. So the university has produced the whole process. See, from this is the package, this is the design, package design the university do. And then this is the Taobao, the, the online streaming, Taobao Dai Huo, So this is the Taobao shop. And then the, the, the leader of the university to say, how they sell, what's the product, how much, how much money they have been made. So the university basically have the whole chain of the, of the enterprise operation for the villagers in Liu Tianqi County. So those are the fact that this is the, uh, the, the teachers from the School of uh, Forestry. I think there are many, many students from School of Forestry, right? Yeah. The teachers from forestry faculties help the farmers to eliminate the pests and disease of those uh, fruits of these uh, uh, economic trees. Right. And then just now we mentioned education is one of the five uh, policies to help to cut off the uh, the the, the, the uh, poverty elimination education. So. In, in the last uh, um, five years, six, seven years, we sent 10 batches of teachers and graduate students 
to the local school from primary to high school to teach. That's, um, to teach uh, nearly 7,000 teaching hours benefits uh, more than 60, that's more than 3,000 families. And it helps this school, nearly 5,000 students from primary to high school for those uh, 10 batches of uh, teachers. Until now, this year, we still send teachers and graduate students to go there. It's not a teach only for a couple of days. They stay there for semesters, for years. You know? So that's the university concern. And then so we are not the only one who do it. All universities done that in China. Not only on classroom teaching, but also organize extracurriculum programs for those students. So those are the pictures. Even more, we open we, we, we organize online study tours. Not all the not, not all the local students can go out, but we can take the take their minds out of the little county, right? We took them not to, not only to say the Forbidden City online study tour, not only Great Wall Forbidden City, but also to, also to let them to visit the famous universities in China, Tsinghua University, Beijing Normal University, Peking University, also our university. And also, and even that, because we send visiting students out of China, and even we take them to, say, the University of London, the UK, online studies, open their minds, open their horizons. So we think it is the most meaningful thing to plant seed of hope to kids. Agree? Agree. Agree. I love this picture very much. So that's the first case of what university is done. Fine, we achieve the goal of eliminating extreme poverty 10 years back. They are very simple, five lessons. First one, a capable and active government and top level commitment. So this is uh, President Xi. And just now I mentioned that there are four levels of administrative system, right? From, from, from central to village. And these four gentlemen, they are the top leader of those levels. Okay? So President Xi Jinping said that no single poor area or single poor person should be left behind in achieving this goal. What goal? The goal is power elimination. Second, many, many, many people argue that, oh, China is too different. China is so much different from other countries. And we can basically learn, learn nothing from China. I argue that. I argue that. For example, Precise poverty elevation by building network by one to one strategy. Just now I mentioned that uh, every institution in China have been paired up with the locals. So this is the data. There are 340 countries in eastern China. You know, in eastern China, where the most arable land here, they are more developed. You know, China is a very is un the, the, the differences between East and the West is a uh, huge, there are large development area, uh, the gaps. So basically the Eastern areas more developed, like it's Beijing, Shanghai, Zhejiang, Jiangsu, Guangzhou, Hong Kong, Xiangang, those places, cities are all in the East, right? So there are more than, there are 343 counties in Eastern China have been paired up with 574 counties in those 14 provinces in central and western China. Three million officials, three million officials has been, uh,
Three million officials have been dispatched as the chief residential officials in those four villages. What 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 do you understand? What what do you think about um, residential officials? You know what is meaning. By, what what is mean by what does it mean by three, by residential officials? Yes, they live there. For those three million people, three million officials, including our university, we sent we sent our staff to there, live there. They are not supposed to fly here and there as a flyman. No, they are they're supposed to live there, to work there, to guide, to work together with those villagers, with the local staff, to guide, provide services and consultations, to guide those villagers how to do it. So altogether, there are more than three million officials have been dispatched as the residential officials in those poor villages. To these enterprises means there are 22,000 enter enterprises also being paired up with those regions, with those uh, uh, companies in those areas. So that's the second lesson. To building networks, to help them building networks, a one-to-one -one sort of strategy. And then the third lesson, why I argue that, because I think this is the lesson every every country can do it. Right? Part with more markets. You know, we help this, we help them to produce the, the crop the, the products, and then you have the products does not mean money, right? You have to sell them. To cultivate markets means to create markets for products and the labor from those poor regions. Altogether, there are this 136,000 products have been identified in those in 22 provinces, including nearly 2,000 counties and 40 thousand suppliers. So at the end of last year, consumption of these products from those poor areas has exceeded 200 billion in China. So this is the picture that the citizens in big cities, they are choosing products from poor villages at the supermarkets. Even in China, in Beijing, in Wudaokou, in Wumei, you can find the products from those poor areas. It's a special area. It's clearly said, clearly said, it, these products are from which poor areas. So cultivate markets. So finally, that's the three lessons. And the fourth lesson, education. The part of the transmission, the education. Lastly, post poverty programs, right? When they lift out, out, out of the poverty, you have to help them of another five years to maintain the, the, the right situation. Post poverty programs. Okay. Really, I don't I don't know whether I answered your questions. Next time we will have a chance. So that's basically what China has to do. Very simple, with the very very simple. Thank you.